What is good, YouTube? I'm coming to y'all with my top five power forwards. We're going to talk about who's the top of the peak. Some things have changed. Some players have moved. This is a weaker position compared to the other ones. This is probably the worst um, outside of the center, probably. Um, but it is still some guys that play at an all-star level or close to it. And it is some guys that have evolved into this position after playing other positions. Um, I want to start off with Tobias Harris. He's always in that conversation as a good player. Still haven't got to that great player yet, but he is a guy that the Sixers depended on, and he had an all-star caliber season at that time, but barely missed the cut probably. And he still can score. He still can take over games from time to time. Can still make big shots from time to time. But his biggest Achilles heel is his playoffs. They paid him a lot of money. They showed him commitment. They feel like he could be a guy for them. And in the playoffs, he, he continues to not perform at his highest level. You mostly want your stars to perform at a higher level in the playoffs. And Tobias Harris has some good series against the Wizards. As guys were smaller, he was able to take advantage of that. But when he went against a better competition and guys that can stay in front of him and stay with him, he dwindled a little bit. And even though I respect what he did in a regular season and I liked how he did dominate somewhat of the Wizards, I do have to look at everything in his entirety. And he falls short of being the top five um, power forward, but he's in the conversation. Um, Sabonis, another all-star appearance. For Sabonis, um, I like him. I like what he brings to the table, a do-it-all guy who you can give the ball to and he can find multiple ways to impact the game. His offensive game, I still think, needs to continue to develop and continue to evolve if he wants to become more of a superstar-level player. But seeing the growth and the improvement to where he was at, in Oklahoma City and to see where he is now, to where he is one of the best power forwards in the league and borderline top five at this point. Um, it just shows you that, you know, giving the right coach and the right belief and the work ethic and the love and the passion for the game, you can become, you know, better than what people think you are, what, what they think you should be. It's all up to you. It's your career. It's your game. And at the end of the day, you really just control that at the end of the day by going out there and do the best you can. And Sabonis has exceeded expectations at this point, even though I still see a lot of growth that he can make in this game. I'm still happy where he's at because I was one of those people that didn't see this happening. And now he's just as good as ever at this point in his career to the point where he can actually run the whole offense. at. And I didn't see that in Oklahoma, but that's what he is now for the Indiana Pacers, and now they're just trying to get back in the playoff race. Five, Zion Williamson, the number one pick, went from missing out on the rookie of the year to bouncing back and becoming an all-star. 27 points per game, just bullying and just running through people. People can't block his shot enough. People can't just take his force, and he has pushed his way up into the echelon of players to where – we look at him as one of the best. And I was a guy that, when the season started, it didn't look like he'd grown a lot. It didn't look like he developed a lot. And then he just took over as a playmaker. He took over as a finisher. And it just seemed like he wanted to prove a message. It just seemed like he wanted to be dominant. And he was able to do that. Anytime you can score that many points, especially with not having a real mid-range game, especially with not having a three-point game, and also not being a great free-throw shooter on top of that, it shows you how good Zion really is. And if you're the Pelican, they was excited to get him. They was excited to have him in. And now we're starting to see a lot more why. And the future is bright for him, especially if he can get better touch outside and from, from the free throw line. That will push his efficiency up. That will push his numbers up higher. And I do think he should be a little bit more better on the boards, too. Because when I look at his rebounding, you see how fast and how quick and how physical he is. You would think he'd be a 20 and 10 guy, but it's just not the case. And that's one of the reasons why I have Julius Randle above him, because Julius Randle was able to shoot the three, be clutch in the mid-range, especially in the regular season, and also be able to bang in that 
playing, but also being a solid free throw shooter. This was a guy that was able to give you 20 and 10, but was able to give you efficiency from basically all over the court in all different type of ways. And that wasn't his game coming into the league, but that's what he is now. And I hope that he can build upon that. You know, he still didn't shoot 50% from the field. I am a 50% guy. If you're one of the best players, you're a dominant player, you should be able to make half or more than half of your shots, especially when you're that close to the basket like Randall is. And even though I like the fact that he did improve every aspect of his game, um, he still does fall short from the elite of this position, which is the top three. And Zion is a guy that I can definitely see moving up in here in the future and, and probably even topping this um, position, um, depending on how he evolves as a player. Number three was AD. I was real disappointed in AD. I felt like he could have been defensive player of the year. I felt like coming off that dominant playoff run in the bubble, that dominant to me um, final series, I was looking at AD and I was just so proud of him. Like, this guy can play. This guy is on another level. And then I came into this season seeing that the Lakers should be the number one team going into the playoffs. And that all crumbled when AD went down with multiple injuries and then went down for a longer period of time. And then LeBron goes down and the Lakers just barely gets into the playoffs and then get out in the first round. That was probably the worst case scenario and probably the worst thing that could have happened because none of us seen it happen until it did. But I just let you know, Nothing is guaranteed in life. You're not guaranteed to live every day, every second. You never know what's going to happen. And AD going down in the playoffs and going down in the regular season really just destroyed the Lakers in general. But when he played, I really wanted him to do more. He didn't really look hungry, didn't really look as dominant on both ends of the court as he did with the first year of LeBron. And hopefully he used that as motivation. They've been saying a lot of stuff. They've been, you know, making a big deal this summer about the roster and the team that they have constructed. Now it's just time for them to walk the walk and talk the talk and, and shut us all up. I'm not a doubter. I'm not an unbeliever uh, of this team that's, that they have, but they still had a hugely disappointing season um, this year, and they have to really rebrand themselves a little bit going into this season. But when I look at AD, didn't play a lot of games, really wasn't as dominant on both ends of the court, but still was the third best power forward um, this season. Number two is Giannis. I know a lot of people might be crazy for that because you look at the fact that Giannis was all NBA first team. You look at the fact that Giannis was finals MVP and was dominant against the Phoenix Suns, and he really showed out getting that 50-point game and showing his defensive ability. But when I see a lot of people saying Giannis, they look at a lot of the past and now, and I don't really think you can do that. He was a defensive player of the year last year. I, I wouldn't have him in the conversation, and he wasn't even a top three player for it this year. Um, and on top of that, he was not MVP. He was one of the best players in the league this year, but he wasn't the MVP this season that was in the prior seasons but he did show up when it mattered most and that was in the finals he didn't look good in the first game he looked at decent not bad and then he was able to go on a dominant run and show you why he's amazing but reality is Giannis had a lot of things go his way and he took advantage of them and cashed it in so you can't hate on him you can't downplay it you have to give him his credit he took advantage of the situation and become iconic and part of history as an NBA champion and is a finals MVP. Now we have to see what he do next year. And number one, everybody pretty much knows Kevin Durant. When you look at what he did in the regular season, he was probably the best player in the league before he went down. I even said it that when I'm looking at the efficiency from the field, when I'm looking at 45% from three, when I'm looking at 88% from the free throw line, the assists are up, the rebounds are up. The scoring is just amazing because he just does that easily. Then you look at the fact that he led all scorers in the postseason and the fact that they was only one shot away from beating the Bucks, and James Harden was toe up and no Kyrie and a lot of other people like Jeff Green and DeAndre Jordan, those guys was injured. Kevin Durant, best power forward. And even Giannis said he's the best player today. He's the best player because Giannis can't take over games from the perimeter he can't hit those threes yet. He might get there eventually, but he's not there yet. 
And he's honest enough to admit that. But Giannis beat those Nets because they had the better team. I looked at the Nets and said, I'm picking the Bucks to win this series once Kyrie went down and Harden was beat up. If they was healthy, they was up 2-0. And I feel like they would have beat the Bucks. But once everybody went down and was injured, the Bucks was the better team at that point. And like I said, they took advantage of the situation and was able to beat the Nets and get to the finals and win it. So you have to give Giannis his credit. You have to give the Bucks their credit. But you also got to give Kevin Durant his credit. When he was on the court, he was the best player in the world. He even showed that in the Olympics. He showed that in the playoffs. And he even, to me, showed that in the regular season, especially those first, well, but basically the middle of the year when he was healthy, he was just deadly. He was just literally deadly the entire time he was healthy, even in the playoffs. And he had some struggle game against the Bucks, but he also had some iconic games against the Bucks and ultimately fell short um, of beating them. But you have to judge everything. So I think Kevin Durant still is number one for the power forwards. Um, and, and we'll see if he can continue to hold that throne next year um, and next season. We'll see if Giannis can surpass him. AD has a rebirth season. Or will Zion come out of nowhere and just be better than all of them? But all these guys are great. All these guys are improved. All these guys had some controversy. All these guys had some doubt. And all these guys was able to persevere through it besides AD, which I'm looking for him to redeem himself this season, hopefully. But we'll see what happens with AD. Other than that, that's my top five power forwards and honorable mentions. And I'll be back with the centers tomorrow. Quinn Wade, Basketball Analysis, signing out.